Many of you have probably heard that the OpenAI organization just released a new machine learning model for text generation. And a lot of people are talking about it because for many reasons, which we won't get into for this video, it's basically state of the art. It was trained on much more data than is typically common. And I have to imagine that the model itself was more sophisticated than what you typically find. But for the moment, just suffice it to say, all you have to do is give it a short prompt about what you want it to write about, and then it will produce a full essay of arbitrary length that is surprisingly readable, let's say. Of course, it often doesn't make total sense, but it sounds quite human-like. And it often does make more sense than you would expect. So that's the news, and a lot of people are talking about it for very good reason. Because once AI can produce essays, at arbitrary length that are not just human-like, but in some sense better than at least a portion of the human species writing ability, that's quite a game changer. And it looks like it's basically here. Now, the OpenAI organization is deciding not to release the full model, but good luck keeping this hidden. If it can be done, it will be done because there's market opportunities. A lot of people think that the relevant benchmark that really matters for the development of AI is when it becomes as good as a smart human. But that's not actually true. If what we're interested in is cultural politics and serious political implications from AI, then what is actually more relevant and more immediate, more immediately on the horizon, is when AI becomes better than let's say the dumbest half of the human population. No offense to dumb people, but... And so it will probably be a long time until AI is as good as a smart human at writing, but it only needs to be better than a non-trivial minority of the population for us to expect some major political ripples. So this gives us a nice opportunity for some larger reflections on the political implications of AI. These reflections certainly apply to the recent news from OpenAI, but they're more general also, so I'm going to put them in a more general fashion. A lot of human competition for social status and income in the form of jobs is based on the competitive production of text. Across our society today, we use the generation of textual documents as one of the major ways in which we convey our intelligence and our capacities. Academia is a wonderful example. For professors and students alike, the production of texts is basically the most common and significant dimension of competition. And this competition is what determines who gets rewards in the form of money, grants, and promotions, and also in the form of degrees and grades and ultimately postgraduate jobs. What happens when widely available artificial intelligence tools emerge and allow anyone, including the dumbest people, to produce fairly high quality, fairly intelligent textual products? Well, one thing that you can expect immediately is that human beings who produce texts at a quality below the threshold at which AI is now able to produce texts are simply no longer going to be able to compete or advance themselves through the production of texts. In the short run, of course, they'll be able to use the AI and submit, you know, undergraduate university essays written by the AI that are actually better than what they're able to produce themselves. In the short term, there'll be some of that, and that might work for a little while um, for the advanced guard of cheating students. But it's easy to see that that's not going to last very long, and in an iterated game, professors will quickly catch on, employers will qu quickly start to realize that uh, a lot of the A-plus students coming out of universities are not A-plus students, and so it's easy to see that that's not going to last long. The only final result of that process is that Textual products are simply no longer a credible signal of a person's type or quality. Unless, of course, you're able to produce texts that are uh, credibly different and better than what AI is able to produce. 
But the, the basic point here is that for some non-trivial fraction of the population, they're just not going to be able to advance themselves in society in any way using the production of text. Okay, so then the next question becomes, what does this fraction of the population that can no longer compete through the production of texts, what are they going to do? Well, looking at the past few years and observing cultural politics recently, I'm going to put my money on two primary diverging pathways. I think that when a fraction of the population can no longer compete on textual production as a signal of their intelligence, you're going to see a kind of bimodal response. Some people are going to start competing on the dimension of morality. Basically, progressive political posturing is still a activity that human beings have a comparative advantage in, in large part because it exploits face-to-face -face social cues. You know, if you can convey your suffering or you can, can convey, you know, calls for compassion, that is going to remain an effective way for human beings to mobilize resources and to advance themselves and to navigate uh, social and economic competition. I think that is why you're seeing a major uptick in this type of behavior right now. I do think that the specter of AI is a major causal factor in the background of the culture wars that we're observing right now. I think you're going to see more and more of that as artificial intelligence increasingly threatens the capacity for a, a fraction of the population to convey its value and to promote itself. I do think there is an alternative route through which intellectually obsolete human beings will be able to distinguish themselves and promote themselves and carve out a place for themselves in society and the economy. And that is competing on the dimension of courage. Courage is a complicated concept, but for the moment, I think we can think about it as simply Courage is that which expresses some sort of intellectual content, but takes a small sacrifice in terms of social legibility or social popularity in the interest of putting something on the table that is largely missing or omitted from the from whatever is convention at the time, but which the speaker finds to be genuinely important for some reason that they uniquely see or, f or feel. In other words, it's not totally uncorrelated with intelligence, but it's not optimizing for the same exact thing that pure intelligence competition is optimizing for. When you're really trying to prove to the world that you're intelligent and that's all you're trying to convey, you know, as you're basically trying to do with an undergraduate essay or with a lot of the other kind of cultural activity that a lot of us do today, you're really trying to optimize for a kind of weighted function of intelligence, but also what other people are most likely to find understandable and valuable and attractive. And in fact, it is intelligent to do that because that is what gets rewarded. So pure instrumental rationality gives you actually a kind of cocktail in practice of, of your ability to identify the truth you want to signal, but also producing something that fits conveniently and efficiently into previously and currently established schemas. That's really what you're optimizing for in most kind of standard intelligence signaling. But when you're competing on courage, you're willing to take a hit on the social legibility and social valuation component of that weighted function. And instead you're, you're trying to make a comparative advantage in something like novelty or kind of hidden social value that people don't currently see or respect enough, but that for some unique reason in your own personal perspective or experience, you genuinely believe is going to be really worthwhile or it's going it's going to uh, become more significant if only you can kind of make people see it against their current short-term tendencies. So courage is something like that. That's a bit roundabout and convoluted, I'm aware. My point is ultimately that courage is this alternative vector on which 
people will be able to compete to convey their truly valuable um, intellectual and social quality. It's just slightly different than what uh, it's slightly different than what people are conventionally most inclined to compete on. AI is most rapidly encroaching on our uh, basic brute instrumental rationality. That's what it's going to be doing better and better than we can uh, at an increasingly rapid pace. But there do remain traits or qualities that m other people recognize as uniquely human, which don't really lean them, which don't really lend themselves to standardized data sets quite as easily. And so any kind of unique human value is going to remain a kind of uh, competitive vector through which human beings can create value and, and, and advance their own interests. So I think you're going to see these as two kind of fundamentally diverging pathways for human beings trying to navigate their, the obsolescence of their kind of simple brute intelligence. So none of these alternative pathways are necessarily long-term solutions and they both have failure modes. And in time, probably they both can be replicated by AI to a degree that's better than our you know, human capacities. But the time between now and then is much greater than it is uh, for, the, for the time between now and when our brute intelligence capacities will be replaced.